Good morning, everybody. I do appreciate that I'm the only thing standing between you guys and lunch, and it does look very exciting as we have range going there, so I'll be prompt. Um, so, I'm Lubita Lazarevich. I work at Neo4j as a, one of the field engineers, and I'm going to give you quite a high-level overview of what is a graph database, more specifically, a property graph database. So, a uh, quick overview of the agenda. I'm going to give you a very brief overview of graph theory, or the origins of graph theory, which then went on to inspire graph databases. I'm going to give you an, at an anatomy of what is a property graph database. I'm going to give you my view of why I think graph databases are great. And then I'm going to go through some of the uh, really common high uh, use cases, high level use cases. So, there was a city, Kingsberg, who was in Prussia, now in modern day Russia, and they had a couple of uh, banks, North Bank, a South Bank, and a couple of islands, and over the years they built a number of bridges, seven to be exact. I think that's changed now. But uh, somebody decided to pose a maths problem, which was, was it possible to visit all of the islands of Kingsberg? using all of the bridges once and only once. So very great mathematician, Euler, decided he was going to look at this and think about a theorem that would prove or disprove these links. And what he did was immediately, let's simplify this down, and effectively he called the bits of information that were useful, or the, the points of interest as nodes or uh, vertexes or nodes, and the connections between them, edges, or as I refer to them, relationships. So immediately simplifying down this bit of information to this. And that's pretty much a graph. So usually when people hear graph theory, graph database, they're thinking of a pie chart or a bar chart you see in Excel. But in this specific context, graph, or graph theory is a branch of mathematics where you're looking at the relationship between two objects and the patterns that ensue within. So, what's a property graph database? Well, we take our graph and we add properties to it. That's pretty straightforward, it's brilliant. And the power of this, so for example here, we've looked at our points of land that we want to join, or the four parts of the city, and we've given them properties, so we've given them names. So, Kant Island, Lomset Island, North Bank and South Bank. We've also added properties to our um, relationships. So we've, we've given the names of the bridges there and what you've constructed. So that effectively is your property graph database. You may also hear a label property graph database, and that's basically these things here. So we've labelled the types of nodes that we're looking at. So we've got a type node of type island, which we've given the label island, and we've got a label type mainland, and then we've got relationship type, which is bridge. So that is the anatomy of the graph data, property graph database. Fairly straightforward so far. So, why are graph databases great? I'm picking a really simple example. So we have a pair of trainers, and we've got three people here who've bought these trainers, Jane, Alison, and Ian. And you think about your traditional um, where you'd store this data in some kind of a relational database. These could be transaction lines, you could have a customer database connecting that and so forth. But there may be something interesting here, and I've got a hunch. I think that these guys have been influenced, or one of these people have been influencing the others to purchase these trainers. So in this example that we're using, I'm going to go off and look at various social media, media sources and look at what these people have been doing. So, Jane has bought a pair of trainers. Uh, she's obviously very pleased about these trainers. She's tweeted about enjoying these trainers. So we're extending this model more and we can have a look. Oh, Alison looks at Jane's tweet and has been inspired by this tweet. She investigates these trainers and she purchases them. She's obviously very happy with her purchase. She's put a post on Facebook. Brilliant trainers. Turns out Ian is friends with Alison on Facebook. Reads the post, also buys the trainers, and so on. 
This is a fantastic thing about graph databases. We can start off with a small model and we can grow it, we can build it, we can add context to it, we can add more information as it comes along. There is a lot of power with this and we're not restricted tightly with the schema. You think about your traditional databases where you, you start thinking about, am I going to extend this in the future or you might append it. You have a f good big deal of flexibility with how you work this. So I'm going to bring up some very common use cases for graphs and we're going to talk around them. So fraud detection. So again, another example uh, of pulled together. We've got three people, Joe, Jane and John. They are recorded as three individuals. They've all got some kind of financial products. So for example, Joe's got a credit card and a loan. Jane has got a credit card and John has got a loan. So a powerful thing with graph databases as well, because the nodes are capturing, capturing an atomic bit of information and you can define that, that, that level of atomicity, what we can do is if there's the same bit of information uh, which is non-duplicated the same, we can link multiple relationships together. So in the context of this, and we start linking together the replicated data, straight away we spot uh, two different people, Jane and John, got the same, share the same dress. That's not unusual. They could be married, flat sharing, so forth. But the interesting ones in red is we've got a national insurance number being shared by two different people. That should not be. A national insurance number is unique to an individual. So that's interesting. So we can create a pattern. Graphs are, graph databases are fantastic for patterns. We can create a pattern to have a look and say, if we've got certain unique information being shared across multiple parties, flag it. We need to investigate that. Another one, a shared landline phone number. OK, nothing huge about that. We could have multiple people sharing a, a landline number. But these two individuals live at different addresses. Again, that's flagging up something interesting. That's something we need to investigate and see what's going on. A really powerful thing about graphs is as we grow them and use them, in, especially in the real-time setting with fraud detection, as people are going around and setting up the accounts and potentially like a fraud ring where they're reusing information, we can be looking for patterns. Now, the patterns could be specific to an identifier or a field, but they, we could be looking at, for example, a density of a node. So does, does a node have lots of relationships? Maybe we need to go investigate that. Is there sort of rings or distant rings where certain nodes are being reused? That could be a point for investigation. We can be looking at that real time so that if somebody then tries to take out a financial product or do a transaction, we can stop it and investigate it further to see if there is cause for concern. Next one. 360 degree customer view. Now, there's lots of interpretations and ways around we do this, but I'm picking an example here where if you're a company selling a product, you will have some kind of campaign, you want to target that product, and ideally you want to target that product to a customer. Now, how do you get this information about how you build this campaign? Now, it's very likely that the customer is going to have some kind of interaction with your company via, say, customer services mechanism. And a lot of companies going digital and having multiple channels. This could be different kinds of interactions, be it social media, be it through email, and so forth. Now, your customer services are going to summarize this information in some sort of way. And this is effectively going to be fed back into the marketing team who can then thereby refine and uh, target better the campaign. Typically, again, depending on the size of your organization, these could be multiple different systems that you're storing this data. Again, with a graph database, because we're flexible, because we can grow it, we can start creating these connections of the data we're pulling out from our sources and join them together and make a relationship. So all of a sudden, we can very clearly see, you know, potentially down to an individual customer, what has been their response to a targeted, uh, targeted advertising. So we can refine that and adapt that for the future. Number three, recommendation systems, and probably one of the most common use cases of graph databases. And this is a very simplistic idea. 
But when we're recommending something, it doesn't necessarily have to be a product. It could be a service, and certainly uh, Turk, uh, the first talk this morning covered, it could be a next best action. It could be a recommended way forward. And graph databases are very powerful for this because, again, we're looking for patterns. We, can, we look for context. We build context, and we search that context through other parts of our graph. So as a very high-level example here, We've got a customer, Joe, he's logged into his account and he's got a basket and he starts to put items into this basket. So he's put in a t-shirt, he's put in a hat, a pair of shorts and some sunglasses. And we can start to build a context about this. Maybe this, the basket context here is he's going on holiday somewhere sunny and these are typically the kinds of items somebody buys when they're doing that. And we can use that information for example, in this case, uh, basket completion. So Matt comes along, he goes, he selects a t-shirt, he also gets a hat, he puts some shorts in. All now, we're getting that 75% of this context he's looking to do. We can now recommend a range of sunglasses because in this scenario, it is quite possible that he's also doing the same thing as Joe is and we can recommend some sunglasses. So again, we can do it to context, we can do it to specific products. We can start weighing the products as well. So, for example, if we know something's out of stock or in low stock, let's not recommend that because we don't want to give that poor customer experience because something's out of stock and we've suggested it. So there's a lot of power behind this as well. So, in summary, property graph databases are based on graph theory. So we showed you Koenigsberg where that was the inspiration for graph, uh, graph theory. A property graph database holds properties as well as uh, properties on the nodes and the relationships. And we can also add labels to, to those as well as a labeled property graph database. And we can start small and slowly grow and build our model because it's flexible and building the schema. And graph databases are absolutely fantastic where we want the relationship to be treated as important as the information it links to. So relationships are treated as a first class citizen. And this is really powerful when we're starting to look at how nodes, so people may be connected or nodes as a product may be connected and so forth. We want to search for behavioral patterns. So again, we may have a specific pattern we're looking for, such as context within a, a recommendation engine, or we may be wanting to look for general points of interest. So are there parts of the graph which are highly connected? Maybe we need to go investigate that. So in a social setting, it could be somebody who has a lot of followers and therefore is an influencer from a point of a fraud. Maybe there is a group of people redistributing and resharing information, and that's a point of interest. And we want to join disparate data sources together. So again, rather than worrying a huge amount, what's our data model going to look like? How are we going to normalize this data? How do we join it? What is our definition for a property? we can start joining the nodes of information from our different data sources together. And again, we can grow and alter the model as required as we get more information and we have a better understanding of where we want to go with this. So that is the end of my talk. So I don't know if we've got time for some questions. So if there's any questions. Oh, sorry, please. Yes. 